nobody shows off photos of what growing out an undercut looks like and that's doing wonders for my self-esteem. <laughs> Hello beautiful people, my name is Venti and today I'm going to be bringing you my February reading wrap up. I know this video is coming in a little bit late, but between some complications that arose after a wisdom tooth removal and then just a bunch of other stuff happening in my personal life, the fact that I'm getting something out at all is something that I'm tremendously proud of myself for. I'm trying to live in the better late than never sort of mindset around this sort of a thing. <laughs> Despite February being a surprisingly hectic month for me, all told, I still managed to read eight books, which I'm pretty proud of, and I'm excited to share my thoughts about those books with you guys today. So Without further ado, let me get into it. The first book that I ended up completing in February was Miles Morales Spider-Man by Jason Reynolds. As the title implies, this book follows Miles Morales as Spider-Man. It takes place a little further down his timeline where the honeymoon period is ended and now he has to not only balance these new superpowers with kind of being a teenage boy and having his real life catch up to him because it didn't really stop once his superheroes began. All the while his superpowers are, as far as he knows, going a little bit haywire and acting up on him. So Miles is an Afro-Latina boy from a poorer community in New York and in addition to sort of witnessing how poorly his people, his community are treated by people who are not part of it. He also has a foot in this other world as he is on scholarship at a super prestigious high school. So he feels a tremendous amount of pressure to succeed. He's not just doing it for himself. Like the people that he grew up around are seeing him and seeing his success and sort of attaching a lot of hope to it. So the pressure from this is extreme. And at the same time, while he's at this boarding school, he is one of very few black students there. So he's got this very specific and tight rope to walk, especially when one of his teachers begins to act incredibly racist towards him. And while he's there, he has very little, if any, support to sort of mourn and come to terms with and like experience the horror of the black boys in his community who are slowly like going missing and nobody's talking about it. And obviously the cops aren't doing anything. So while trying to figure out what's going on with his superpowers, what's going on with all of these young black men going missing and nobody doing anything about it and figuring out who is the person who's trying to get him kicked out of or losing his scholarship to attend this university. Miles is also having to figure out internally how to find a balance between his anger as a tool for enacting change and creating a fire within himself to actually get these things solved and a restraint because very often that self-same anger is used to demonize young black men when they show it outwardly. And of course it wouldn't be a Spider-Man story if Miles did not throughout all of this have to kind of reckon with what it means to have his powers and what responsibilities should be his now that he has them versus like how he can use them for his own gain. One thing I really liked about Reynolds's book is that I think he writes children very honestly. The ways that Miles sort of acts when he is at school with his friends or kind of getting really flustered and tongue-tied around his crush or like kind of having stage fright in terms of like sharing poetry that he has written, all of that felt very honest and true to like a teenage mindset and the preoccupations and priorities that a sort of 16 year old would have, whether or not they had superpowers. I also love that at no point, despite Miles having these superpowers, was there ever any question of him being a kid, if that makes sense. When he's interacting with his mom and dad, despite them not being, you know, preternaturally gifted with like speed and dexterity and like magical spider webs that shoot out of his wrist. When Miles feels scared and in trouble, they are who he turns to and they provide a source of comfort, whether that's in tough love form or whether that's in just like, embracing open arms form and it's really good to see a kid so loved on page and that was made all the more true by the sort of contrasting examples that Jason Reynolds put all around Miles of people who maybe didn't have so close a relationship with their parents or didn't have one at all and how those different familial structures and a lack of or an overabundance of support change the way that kids are enabled to thrive. Another thing that as a Spider-Man enthusiast myself that I really enjoyed was that it's obvious that Jason Reynolds knows and loves the Spider-Man mythos and the way that he blends it with Miles's preoccupations and the story was wonderful. I think he did a great job of making not just a Miles Morales story, but a Spider-Man story. Now as for some details I didn't necessarily connect with 100%, um, I didn't really enjoy Miles's best friend and sort of comic relief character Genki. I found him to be quite juvenile, like far more so than a 16 year old would be. Like he acted, I think, emotional maturity age of like a middle schooler in a way that I think sort of pulled me out of the story a couple of times. He had his moments of some emotional death, but they were always sort of replaced by like a funny one-liner or whatever. And I didn't necessarily love that. He felt very much like a comic book comic relief character there for just like one or two panels. And I don't know that that necessarily translated to novel form in a way that I personally responded to. 
but nonetheless Genki was always in Miles's corner and it was really good to see a sort of healthy relationship between two young men like that. I also thought that the introduction of poetry as a sort of form of self-expression and figuring out one's own identity was a little bit on the nose as a literary device, but I do think it was a valuable one regardless. It was a fun through line to follow as Miles sort of began to reckon with what he was and who he was and his position as a person with a relative amount of power compared to other people. I think it was a little bit on the nose, but overall I think it was an effective way to tell that part of the story. I sort of wish that it had been interwoven a little more organically, like Miles's crush on a poet at his school, perhaps prompting him to write this poetry by himself rather than it being an assignment that might have been I think a little bit more effective for me personally. I only mention this because it contrasts so heavily with a theme exploration device that Reynolds used in another aspect of the story that I think was woven in beautifully and very organically. So the contrast to me kind of stands out. The one that I think was done very well was Miles talking to the Black man of his community, including his father, and sort of exploring the ideas of anti-Blackness as an inherited and a shared trauma within his community. The mystery of the story, which was incredibly easy to solve, but I don't think the point of it was that it was complicated, so I'm giving it a big old pass there. But the point of it was, it was a story that had happened over and over and over again. When the Black men around Miles were young, something happened in their lives, whether within the criminal justice system or within their educational systems or what have you, where they were placed at a constant disadvantage or forced to react with anger after somebody kept poking and poking and poking at a bruise that ultimately led to their futures and their progress being derailed. And Miles is allowed through these conversations, through this building of community to sort of figure out that what's happening to him is part of a cycle that's been going on for decades, if not centuries, and find that strength within himself and use that anger in a way that benefits not just him, but his community as a whole and gives himself basically some solid ground to stand on to figure out what his identity is, whether or not he's Spider-Man, whether or not he's anything other than himself. Overall, I think Jason Reynolds is a really talented writer. If he writes more Spider-Man stuff, you know I'm going to be picking it up just because I think he understands the like ethos and the pathos of this character in a way that really jives with my understanding of him as well. Following that, I read Ring Shout by P. Jelly Clark. This is a novella set in the early 1900s following Maris and her friends Chef and Sadie, who have the ability to see and therefore fight and kill monsters that are taking over the bodies of KKK members by feeding on the Ku Klux Klan members' existing hatred and bigotry and anti-blackness. And at the start of this book, they realize that the Ku Kluxes, which is the name given to the monsters that have taken over and are sort of hiding amongst the other KKK, the human KKK members, are getting stronger and are here mobilizing and planning to expand their numbers and eventually pretty much take over the world. Though this book is relatively short, I don't think it breaks 200 pages. It packs one hell of a punch. I used to think that I struggled with novellas and that I didn't like them very much because I always felt that something was missing, whether it come from the plot or the world building or the characters. I'll Always something somewhere would give. But perhaps I just hadn't been reading the right novellas up till now because this had all of those factors in spades. I think P. Jelly Clark is kind of a master of world building and not just in the terms of creating the world but in terms of figuring out how much of it one needs to reveal to create a cohesive narrative in itself. So the Ku Kluxes, the monsters in this world that Maris and her friends are trying to destroy and save the world from, are kind of monsters hidden amongst men. They were allowed into this world based on the overwhelming festering hatred with than members of the KKK that already existed, and more and more are let in as this hatred grows in other human beings and other tremendously racist things going on during this time in American history. So they fester within the hatred of these people and eventually they fully take over and consume the vessel from inside out until there's nothing but an inhuman, hungry, evil thing remaining. And what makes it worse is that not just within the plot of the story, but overall within the world that P. Jelly Clark has created, these creatures are intentionally spread. This hatred is intentionally encouraged within others to make more room for this monstrous, hungry entity that wants to come in and take over. On the less horrific and more our protagonist-centered side of things, there's also a beautiful exploration of the folklore. Each section of this book is begun by a historical exploration of what ring shouts are, and then they're just woven into the narrative of this book without 
you know, a tremendous amount of explanation. They are as true and as real, even more true and more real than the hatred and the bigotry of the KKK. But where Ring Shout really stood out for me was its character work. I really loved Maris and her friends, both those on this world and in the spiritual world where Maris has a connection to. All of them have suffered a tremendous degree of loss, but are still all called together to fight this threat, not just to themselves, but to the world at large. But instead of being sort of dour and, and, and bound and restrained by this like tremendous degree of purpose that they all have, together they find that their community and their love for one another and the support and the joy that they can find together is actually the greatest strength that they have, even more so than magical swords. A really important element of this story and Mayers' journey overall is Mayers' reckoning with her own emotions. And at first her refusal to deal with her trauma and her festering her own hatred against these people who have harmed her and her family seems like it is the strength that she needs to defeat the Ku Kluxes and their whole deal. But ultimately where she draws her strength from and where her success in the end comes from is not from hatred, but from love, the tremendous amount of love that she has for her friends and they have for her. Truly have no notes. I cannot wait for the next thing that P. Jelly Clark writes because I will be picking it up. After this, I completed season two of Suitor Armor, a webtoon written by the author Purpa. This story follows Lucia, who is a lady in waiting to the current queen of a kingdom that is at war with fairies. I say at war. The war is only only theoretical at this point because the fairies entered into a contract with the humans and because fairies can't lie they are bound to uphold the contract whereas the humans are able to break it and kind of do whatever and the fairies have been sort of pushed to the absolute outmost limits of this world. When they are captured they are often mutilated or killed but despite humanity kind of having their beat on the necks of these fairies, fairies are still considered based on various propagandas and stuff to be incredibly dangerous and harmful to humans so there's still like this reign of terror. And Lucia's great secret is that that she is secretly a fairy herself. But the jig is kind of up now that she and her queen friend Kiersey are adults now and have to enter the political sphere a little more fully. And because Lucia develops a very close friendship with an animated suit of armor known as Modius, who me and some of the other fans speculate Okay, I realized that I just uh, spoiled a big old plot point that happens during season two, so I'm just gonna cut that bit out in post-production. My point is there's a whole lot of political intrigue, there's a lot of fantasy, it's a little bit of a romanticy, so if you're that kind of girly, I strongly recommend you pick this up. It is completely free to read online. I'll have a link to the webtoon site where you can read it linked below if it's something that interests you. What I really enjoy about Suitor Armor and why I've continued reading it is because of the character work. I feel like the author is doing a very good job of creating complex circumstances that characters have to react to. It creates conflict even between people who in theory love each other and in theory want to do best for each other but simply can't overcome certain complications that arose because of this thing that they both needed to react to. I had a couple of complaints in season one about Lucia's sort of passivity and overabundance of optimism but I feel like in season two we really see a little bit more of the traits that we enjoyed in her in season one. So her pragmatism and her ability to empathize and be kind and compassionate. But also we see her kind of grow a backbone and realize like, no, I can't just like nice people out of their bigotry. Like I, I need to stand up for things and put my money where my mouth is in terms of my moral standings. Otherwise I'm just as bad. Well, not just as bad, but otherwise I'm complicit in some of the cruelties that other people are taking part in just because I'm not standing against them. So seeing her grow into herself and sort of take agency over her ability to do magic and her position within the court was really empowering and I really enjoyed seeing that growth in her. I also enjoyed seeing her sort of unisolate herself and find a greater support system among her friends, including but obviously not limited to Modius, though I do really enjoy Lucy and Modius's relationship. And then it's very hard to talk about it without spoiling, so I'll just say the twist that happened at the end, the sort of cliffhanger that we're left off at, was um, really rough uh, and horrifying and I'm really glad that I waited to read it until until another couple of episodes were out from the season three um, of this webtoon because if I had to end the story on that cliffhanger I would have lost my ever loving mind. <laughs> Again cannot recommend this one enough for any of my romanticy girlies so I do have it linked in the description box below. No pressure to read it but if you do please let me know because I need somebody to scream about it with and I don't know anyone like in real life who's read it. Following that I reread A Blade So Black and later in the month I also read A Dream So Dark books one and two of the Nightmareverse by L.L. McKinney. The tagline for this series is what if Buffy fell down the rabbit hole instead of Alice and it is one of the most effective taglines that I've ever heard 
heard for a series. It follows our protagonist, Alison Kingston, who in a very 90s anime way is taught to fight and kill the nightmares that human emotions of negativity create within Wonderland when they come into our world through rips in the veil. Some things go very wrong in the first book and her mentor, Addison Hatta, is left unable to guide her and Alice has to go on this whole adventure to figure out how to save not only Hatta but all of Wonderland and maybe our world itself. I'm not going to go further into depth about these books because I have a full series review planned. In fact, I think that's the next video I'll have up on my channel. I mean, it might be obvious considering I'm planning to do a series review, but I absolutely loved my rereads of these books. I flew through them. They are so pacey and so, so, so good. And the only complaint I have is that once I finish A Crown So Cursed, which is book three and the final book of the series, it will be over and I won't know what to do with myself. After that, I read Honey Girl by Morgan Rogers. This book follows Grace Porter, a recent graduate of her PhD program in astronomy. Grace, or Porter as most people call her, is a incredibly type A woman. She has plans for her plans for her plans. She never has a hair out of place. So after her graduation, when she and her two best friends, Agnes and Xiomara, end up going to Las Vegas to celebrate, the last thing anybody, including herself, would expect Porter to do is get drunk and get married to a complete stranger, who by the time Grace wakes up in the morning in her hotel room is already long gone and is left behind just a little note and a smell that Grace can't get out of her mind no matter how hard she tries. After Grace is rejected for a position that she was hyper qualified for pretty much because she is a black woman, this spontaneous marriage is sort of the last straw and throws Grace completely off of the tracks that she has been on since childhood. So on a whim, she ends up finding all she can about this woman that she's married, Yuki Yamamoto, figures out that she is a podcaster from New York and ends up spending the summer with the woman who turns out as her wife. I really wanted to love this book. I feel like it speaks to a lot of the things that I really loved in my reading last year of women in their quarter life crisis era kind of making poor decisions and everything crashing around them. And to some degree that is true about Grace. However, where I think this book kind of fell flat for me is the one place where a book cannot fall flat for me without it kind of ruining the whole thing and souring in my mouth mostly and that is within the characterization. We get a lot of lip service about Grace and her depth of relationship that she has with people such as Yamara and Agnes, her friends from her hometown, and the depth of her connection with Yuki once the two of them meet, but none of that is really explored on page, nor does it really feel believable. I'm not saying that a woman who is in crisis and having an identity crisis the way that Grace is having is unrealistic and that when a woman is in that sort of a position she might be more of an emotional taker than a giver, but at no point did I buy that Grace had any qualities that would make people like her at all. When her friends come to her with problems she is quite unsympathetic and cannot seem to understand that they might have issues themselves and the way that the book is written it doesn't seem as though we're meant to consider Grace just like an unlikable and thus interesting character because of that. We're meant to sort of be taking her side and believe that she's in the right when she minimizes other people's problems. It's as though she's less a character in her own right and more the on paper idea of what a super burnt out, very anxious and depressed, type A high achieving black queer woman would look like. I think this becomes most clear when you see the conversations that characters have with one another. They feel quite stilted and wooden as though instead of two people talking, it's an attempt to prove a point. There's a conversation in particular that I'm thinking of where a friend of Grace's from her hometown comes to visit her while she's staying with Yuki in New York. And while they're out for drinks, this friend of Grace's ends up telling her about some struggles that he has with worrying about letting his father down and how much he's had to sacrifice within his own life in order to make sure that his sister and his father are okay and safe after the death of his mother. And out of kind of nowhere, this conversation turns into what I think is meant to be an argument because we're told that they're angry at one another, but really it doesn't read that way at all. And the conversation, despite these two people being inebriated enough to have a drunken argument on page or talking incredibly lucidly and woodenly around one another. I don't know how to explain this without spoiling it, but it very much felt like, how are you two close enough that he calls you his brother and you don't know each other well enough to understand what the other one is saying and where they're coming from. How do you know each other so little but still have this professed closeness and adoration for one another? And it'd be fine if it was just one relationship where Grace was just like, oh, okay, like I've kind of been a bad friend to this one person and I didn't know him very much at all. And that's a thing that we have to overcome. But truly it's every relationship in the book, everyone that she talks to, 
it kind of sounds exactly like that. There is no distinction in terms of character voice. By far the best part of this book is the sort of last fourth and fifth of it where Grace is finally reckoning within herself all of the everything that she's been putting off up until that point and realizing how much by imposing all of these rules upon herself she has sort of stunted her own ability to grow as a person. And I think that would have felt a lot better and more honest if we felt any of that in the first three fourths of the book. <laughs> Instead that was something that we had to very much infer. I did enjoy that Grace took the time to heal for herself. I enjoy that, you know, she started therapy. I enjoy the fact that she started sort of destigmatizing the idea for herself that she was a person instead of like a highly achieving machine. All of that felt very important, but the lead up to there didn't feel honest and it truly felt like reading like two different stories, one of which was boring and kind of a slog to get through, like it kind of put me in a slump, <laughs> and the rest of which felt like a conclusion to a different story, a conclusion that didn't really work because there was nothing concrete to conclude from. And I think it's a shame because I think Morgan Rogers is a very gifted writer in terms of the prose that she puts on page. It felt and read very clean, lyrical without being purple prosy. And I think she has the capacity to write really, really intense and nuanced character relationships, like Grace's relationship with her father. Towards the end, when they finally sat down and had a real conversation, I was like, oh, there it is. There's that depth. There's the messiness in the confrontation when you guys talk to one another that you were capable of this entire time but these are the only two characters that you even pseudo fleshed out so it's like oh you had so much meat <laughs> you had so much meat and you just didn't cook it and I feel like if you're going to flesh out two characters in a book about sort of the start and the falling in love process and then the disillusionment and disenchantment of figuring out that both of you are people with flaws if you're gonna do that gotta make the love interest the person that you flesh out to <laughs> perhaps I could have put up with all of the rest of the woodenness and the two-dimensionality of the other characters if at the very least Yuki and Grace's relationship was given the page space and the nuance that it deserved. Unfortunately, Yuki did kind of get not like other girls out of being a character and into being almost like a prop for Grace's coming to terms with who she is. Yuki kind of got the 500 days of summer treatment, which was a damn shame because she could have been very interesting. I did like how unapologetically queer this book was and I did enjoy the at least attempts of found family, not only with Grace, but also that Yuki had her own family before Grace came along and how Grace was welcomed into that group as well. I just wish the characters were a little less prop and more people. That instead of standing in for things that I think the author wanted to say, they were allowed to say those things through their actions and connections with one another and let those actions shape the story and the plot moving forward. Following that, I read John Green's The Anthropocene Reviewed. This is a collection of essays slash podcast scripts that John Green has been writing for a couple years now. The idea behind The Anthropocene Reviewed is that John takes things such as the song Auld Lang Syne or Sunsets or The World's Biggest Ball of Paint or Tuberculosis and he rates them on a five-star scale the way that you would with like Google reviews or something. I've been a Vlogbrothers fan since I was I think in like middle school or high school and I have read everything that John Green has ever written and for me The Anthropocene Reviewed is the best thing he's ever done. The humor and the compassion and the passion with which he writes about these various topics whether he five or one stars them acts not only as a sort of viewpoint into this one man's mind and his feelings about the world but also in a very real way creates a pastiche and a collage of the Anthropocene, the human era. But also those aren't the things that I necessarily would have chosen to to write about as a emblematic portion of stuff to review from the Anthropocene and I'm pretty sure they're not the things that you watching this would have chosen if you were the one writing an Anthropocene reviewed book. So in addition to being a collage that's emblematic of this time, it's also a collage that's very emblematic of John Green's time on this world and the things that he chooses to put his focus on. So it's an anthropologic study, but maybe it's mostly an anthropologic study of John Green and his preoccupations. I don't know, but I did very much enjoy it. Many of these scripts were written during the COVID times. So there is a sort of ever present sort of looming cloud of the awareness of that great and ongoing human tragedy, coloring the feelings about the other things being talked about, but that in no way detracts from the honesty with which they are written. I really don't know how to talk about this further. It's it's so specific and each individual chapter, I guess you'd call it, section of the book is its own unique thing and the collection of them, as I mentioned earlier, are quite eclectic so it's hard to talk about how one bridges into the other very much if it bridges at all. I'll leave linked in the description box below John's video on Auld Lang Syne, which I don't know if it's a one-to-one 
exact replica of the chapter that is in the Anthropocene Review, but it is a really solid example of what the book looks like. And if you enjoy that video and what it looks like, I highly recommend picking up the book. And if you can, pick up the audiobook. That's how I ended up reading it um, because John actually does the narration for it. So you're hearing all of these essays as he wants them heard, which I always find quite valuable. <laughs> I've been sitting here filming for the better part of the hour and I'm quite tired, but we are in the very home stretch because the final book that I read in the month of February was The Girl in the Tower by Catherine Arden. This is the second book in her Winter Night series, starting with The Bear and the Nightingale. I ended up rereading The Bear and the Nightingale last month, but in case you missed my January wrap up where I explained The Bear and the Nightingale, the entirety of the Winter Night series follows the story of Vasya, the youngest daughter of a Russian boyar who has the ability to actually see the, the, the spirits that come from old pre christian Christian folklore in this area of the world. After the events of the first book, it is no longer safe for Vasya to remain in her hometown. So she and her magical horse, Solove, end up doing what Vasya has always wanted to do, which is which is bucking off the sort of expectations put on daughters and female children and going off to see the wider world and explore and have all of these adventures. It does not go easy for Vasya at first because again, as a young girl who has sort of been in one village her entire life, she is woefully unprepared for the wider world at large. Luckily, the spirit of the winter, known as Morozko, has an affinity for Vasya and keeps an eye out for her. He teaches her how to dress like a boy and how to hold her own in a knife fight, which is a skill that she will need to use if she is planning on masquerading as a boy and going out throughout the wilderness. And as Vasya ends up going out on these adventures, she realizes that Tartars are coming in and ruining and burning Russian villages down to the ground, and the people, the victims of these crimes predominantly end up being women and children. And obviously as a woman and former child herself, she feels a deep affinity for these girls and wants to figure out a way to help them, even if that means going to Moscow to appeal to her cousin the Tsar and thus putting a lot of attention on herself and making it so that her status as a human woman uh, is discoverable and, and the story really goes from there. The Girl in the Tower does everything that I want my sequels to do in that it expands on everything that was established in book one. Obviously the world gets bigger because we see more of it with Vasya's travel going out and around. We see the way that other people live. Vasya grew up quite privileged regardless of how constrained she was as a woman during this time and in this place. She's never been hungry, she has never been sick without there being help around, and she's never been in a place where the spirits, the Cherti, have been as weakened as they have in the rest of Russia by the overwhelmingly rising tide of Christianity. Obviously around her who could see them and who worshipped them, they were very very strong, but now she's coming across one that can't help her as much. And on top of that, the winter is slowly giving way to spring, so even Morozko's power is not as omnipresent and strong as it was in the first book. You couldn't really rely on him in The Girl in the Tower to get Vasya out of trouble if she needs, at least not all the time. On the other hand, Vasya has never seen any sort of thing quite as grand as the great city of Moscow and the enormous streets and the bazaars and the wealth of people from all walks of life. It's all very, very grand to her as a pretty much village girl from a farm. She's completely naive to the political machinations that are necessary for the powerful to survive in these sorts of situations. Whether or not they are rich, whether or not that they are influential, there's always sort of the noose around their neck of somebody more powerful than them who is ready to pull and take advantage and put somebody else in their place if they're not careful. These are things that Vasya's sibling who ended up leaving in The Bear and the Nightingale but feature heavily in this book, her older sister Olga and her older brother Sasha, who is a priest but is also sort of like a warrior priest who's traveling a lot, um, they know that very, very well. And so as Vasya is reintroduced to these people, who she loved as a child and who she loves still, but who can't quite trust her in the same way because she's breaking all of these social rules and mores, there's a lot of clashes within this family. It doesn't make their family bond any less strong, but it does make it more on the knife's edge and teetering and dangerous for all involved parties. And of course, if Vasya's secret of knowing about the house spirits was a small danger in the previous book, in The Girl in the Tower, we recognize that the far greater threat is pretending to be a boy. The spirits are one thing, madness is one thing to buck against a society that has very, very strict rules and limitations for what women are allowed to do. That is a far more dangerous thing and that is a far more difficult thing for her to reckon with. Even as her popularity and her star is on the ascent as she pretends to be Vasily Petrovich, the threat of being revealed to be herself, of being Vasilisa Petrovna, hangs ever more ominously above her head. And though I said that the charity that Vasya 
interacts with and encounters in the bear, pardon me, in the girl in the tower are weaker than the ones that we'd witnessed before, that does not make the elements of magic any less intense and strong, which I won't elaborate on further, given that it is incredibly spoilery and I feel like everyone should read these books, so I don't want to spoil anyone and otherwise discourage them from picking this book up themselves. Also, the relationship between Vasya and Morosko grows in a tremendous way in this book. In the first book, when Vasya is still very much a child, there is a very caring relationship from one to the other, but as she matures and grows and as she becomes a little more wise to the ways of the world, the relationship between the two not only becomes deeper in the sense that she recognizes the feelings that she has for him and vice versa are not necessarily so childlike and immature in nature, but also she begins to recognize his fallibility and that she is not the only one benefiting from the two of them seeing and knowing about one another, if that makes sense. I very much enjoy both of them sort of stumbling into feelings for one another and figuring out what those means and those incredibly charged moments that the two of them have with one another, while at the same time, because again, spring is coming, because we are in Moscow and therefore surrounded by Christianity, Morosko is weaker and weaker and Vasya ends up having to not only save him, but save herself as well. I feel like Vasya really becomes a woman in this book in that before she had the wide-eyed wonder and naivete of like the maiden in the fairy tale archetype way, whereas now she understands a lot more for better or worse, and the things that she understands aren't always beautiful, but they are always important. Obviously, I've really enjoyed The Girl in the Tower, and I'm currently reading the third and final book of the Winter Night series, so I'll have that in my March review more likely than not. So you guys will get to know my full series thoughts about this series very, very soon. And there you have it. That is my February reading wrap up. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you liked it, please leave me a thumbs up. And if you like me, maybe consider subscribing to my channel. I post videos every Thursday and I would love to have you be part of my bookish family. Comment down below if you've read any of these books and tell me what you thought of them. Or if writing out a full comment is simply too much, why don't you leave me a, let's call it a red heart a heart for February and red because I think it features in every single one of these covers, which I do enjoy. Regardless, that is it for me. Thank you again so much for watching this video and I'll see you at the next one very, very soon. Goodbye.